Hey everyone, welcome to our webinar today. We'll give everyone a few minutes to cycle in here. In the meantime, at a poll here for the audience. You can let us know what sector you're here from today, whether that's law enforcement, fire, different industry, or just using drones for personal use and looking to learn a, a little bit more. So, see that quick poll up for to take a look at. And we'll go ahead and get started here. Just a few minutes. All righty, go ahead and close the poll out here. And yeah, we've got about 27% from uh, law enforcement, 9% fire, and then 60% from other industries looking to learn a bit more today. So yeah, thanks for taking some time to vote there. We'll do some polls throughout so you guys can see some different uh, results. But without further ado here, we'll go ahead and get started on today's webinar, Improving Crash Scene Reconstruction with the Maverick 3 Enterprise and DJI Terra. A couple notes before we get started. The webinar is being recorded, so after the webinar is done, all registrants will receive an email with a recording of the webinar. There's also in the handouts tab, a resources document where you can find links to lots of helpful information that we're going to cover today. And then also towards the end of the webinar, we'll have a quick survey that you can fill out if you'd like to get a three month trial license to DJI Terra. One other note before we jump into things here is that we understand that teams utilize different hardware, software, and processes. So at the end of the day, we do encourage networking with other agencies and personnel in your area to figure out what workflows and tools work best for you. Excited to be joined today by, first of all, Aaron Beckman, who is an active firefighter from Norfolk, Nebraska where he's been working since 1999. He has a strong background in fire science and has been documenting scenes for over 20 years for the fire department. Works with multiple agencies in Nebraska and has aided in numerous cases. Since 2014, he has been mapping investigations utilizing various products. And specifically in 2019, he was able to assist several agencies during Midwest floods for search and rescue recovery and structural damage mapping. So we're really happy to have Aaron on today. We also have Brandon Carr from Pearland, Texas. He's a former chief pilot at the Pearland Police Department and UAS program coordinator there. Also worked as a night shift patrolman. He's recently joined the team at DroneSense as a solutions engineer for drone as a first responder. Brandon started his interest in aviation back in 2006, where he earned his commercial and CFI license for manned fixed wing, single engine, multi-engine, and instrument rating. And he was able to leverage that aviation knowledge to start the Perlin Police Department's UAS program. Since then, he's been able to assist over 250 agencies in starting or developing their programs across the nation. So really happy to have both Brandon and Aaron on today. These are both people I'm always bouncing off ideas and talking about accident reconstruction with, so happy they're able to take some time to join us today. My name is Grant Hostka. I lead our solutions engineering team over at DJI Enterprise. And then we also have Chief Wayne Baker on here as well, helping with some questions as well. So appreciate um, him hopping on. He's our director of public safety integration. 
And before we get started today, wanted to quickly remember Detective Eric Gunderson. He actually passed away in the line of duty in 2021 from COVID-19. He was an early adopter of drone technology and provided training across the state of Washington on the value of drones for crash reconstruction and actually was one of the first people I met who taught me a lot about the workflow for crash reconstruction. So we appreciate Eric and his work and remember him at the start of the webinar today. But jumping into things with our panelists first and with a, another poll in the meantime from our panelists. Um, start me off, Brandon, why do we use drones in crash scene reconstruction at a, at a high level? What are the, the big points to remember? The reason that we were utilizing drones for crash reconstruction is it's much faster um, and it's much safer. So by utilizing drones, we're able to collect a ton of data for that crash scene, get accurate measurements, and get that roadway clear, which allows the ability, it allows citizens to go back to work, and go home, allows officers and other first responders to be able to go back in service, uh, which reduces the likelihood of a secondary crash. Yeah, absolutely. I think you nailed some key points right there. Aaron, and how about on, on your end, what brought you in to start doing a crashing reconstruction with, with drones? You know, with me, uh, you know, I'm not law enforcement, I'm fire. So, you know, when we get to a scene, uh, you know, we work the scene as, as first responders uh, with the fire department. And then I step away and start documenting that scene. With the fire, uh, what that drone does for us is, you know, it provides us a map. So after the scene, we can sit there and debrief uh, when we get back to the station on, you know, how we came into that particular scene with our apparatuses. Um, and, you know, we could sit there and, and uh, uh, prepare for the next, uh, the next scene of that particular, you know, incident and uh, get ready for the next scene. So, you know, with fire, it's always uh, uh, prepare for the next call. So uh, it doesn't matter if it's accident or, or fire. It just gives us another, another way of, of uh, preparing for the, next, for the next call. So Absolutely. So taking a look at our quick poll results here, looks like we have about 21% of attendees who've used drones for crashing reconstruction, 52% who have not, but have used drones for creating 2D maps or 3D models, and then 27% who haven't done either. So hopefully some valuable information for everyone today, but interesting to have that a data point kind of going in. So the solution we are talking about today is our DJI Enterprise solution, which really is comprised of three parts, collecting data, processing that data, and selecting a drone, selecting a tool uh, for that mission. So talk about things at a, a high level, we're gonna get into how that data collection works um, from the controller side, what, different data collection strategies look like, how to supplement the automated data capture. And then finally, getting into creating 2D maps and 3D models. And here's one from Brandon's side where you can see that 2D map on the left side, and then our 3D model output here, which really does look like a photo, but is actually a 3D model from the, the Terra side. So. We're gonna break this down into different sections today, talking about what goes into selecting a drone, preparing the scene, actually collecting that data, processing the data, what we do after the fact, utilizing that data, or we'll run through some examples. There'll be a survey option to get a three month trial to Terra. And then we'll have some questions at the end, um, some you submitted beforehand, and then we'll take some from Chief Baker as well after that as time permits. So first off, selecting a drone. And go to Aaron here to start. Why is the Mavic 3 Enterprise a good tool for the job or a tool you would consider using for crashing reconstruction? It's a quick deploy aircraft. It's small, uh, smaller aircraft. 
you know, before you'd have to have that bigger aircraft. Um, it took up a lot of space in a, in a patrol car or in a, you know, in a, in a response vehicle where the Mavic 3 uh, E um, or the thermal uh, also, um, you know, it fits in the smallest Pelican case. The cool thing about the Mavic 3 is, is it's a mechanical shutter. So, you know, it, 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 it provides a, a good uh, image. Um, and like I said, it's quick deploy. Uh, the other thing I like about that Mavic 3 Enterprise right now series is it runs that that uh, 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 app uh, 2 series uh, in, the, in the controller. And so it, this seems like it's a little bit smoother to run uh, based off of, you know, before we had that advance uh, that runs just the, the, just the app, you know, the, the DJI uh app one uh this this dji2 uh in the in the controller just seems like it runs a little smoother uh and it's faster processing um when it, when when you get to the map mapping process of that so it's a, it's a good all around drone so and longer flight time <laughs> longer flight time also got to got to add that fl longer flight time so <laughs> yeah definitely able to stay up longer to get a scene done and in one battery instead of coming down for a, a swap um, I wanna, we I did have a, sorry go ahead I want to touch base uh, the mapping aspect of the thermal is 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 quite remarkable too uh, I was I was really shocked with the with the thermal with the map of the of the m3t uh, is definitely way better than 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 what the than what they had uh, what the advance was I was I was really shocked what what the map uh, capability of the M3T was. So, yeah. Cool. And something we did have from attendees coming in too, and Brandon, I think this is something you could touch on with your experience, was where would you consider using something like the bigger aircraft and the bigger sensor, like the P1? Is that a tool you want to have in your, your toolbox as, as well? Or how does that stack up against the Mavic 3E for your crashing reconstruction deployment? Uh, so we actually use the a little bit of both. Um, so we have the M300 with the P1, uh, we have, and we have the M3E. Where we use the P1 is going to be uh, very large scenes that I don't want to spend running either multiple batteries with, or I want to be able to fly higher and not lose that kind of data by utilizing the P1, um, not losing that that clarity. Uh, so typically if it's a really long scene or a really large scene um, we'll use the p1 we also will be utilizing the p1 for uh, disaster responses so if we're using some uh, needing to do a mapping mission to see, do a damage assessment like for example uh, there was a tornado that just came through the houston area not too long ago we can map that area with a p1 system fly higher not lose clarity not lose data and take less photos uh, so it's really beneficial for that we typically will use the Mavic 3 Enterprise if we need to fly lower altitudes uh, due to tree lines or power lines or things of that nature uh, where we don't want to run the risk of running a, a larger platform. Um, so it just kind of depends on the on the incident and the operation. Sometimes we use both. Uh, it just, just depends on the scene. So, yeah, it's a great camera. Yeah, that's a good good point there. And, and Aaron already touched on this one a bit. Um, but when we get into our DJI systems that have a thermal camera, such as the Mavic 3T or the M30T, we do have a smaller wide camera that we'd use for, for mapping. So we do lose a bit of our, our sensor size, and then we don't have a mechanical shutter either. Um, but Aaron, uh, it's pretty much what you just said, you're still able to use that visual visual camera for, for mapping, even though maybe you give up a bit of resolution or, or speed. Yeah, you give it up just a little bit, but but I, I, like I said, I was shocked on, on the clarity of, of the map uh, when we ran it through Terra for the first time. I, you know, we, we've done some maps with the advance uh, and you know it works, um, especially when we're out fighting fighting a uh, a grassland fire. You know where we wanted to see how much acres were burned, uh, and it's doable. Uh, but you know if you had to fly an accident scene with it, eh, it's a little, maybe a little questionable. Um, but with the with the M3T, um, 
it's it's doable if 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 that's the only aircraft that you got uh within your agency it is doable uh i was really shocked on on the on the clarity of the model of the 3d model and of the ortho you know looking straight down of of that particular map so yeah good good points there and just giving a quick table here for people to understand as well with any of these really three aircraft or sensor combinations, you do have mission planning built in uh, to the Pilot 2 app on the controller and SDK options. A smart Oblique option is only available with um, the first two here. The, the Mavic 3E or the M300 and the P1 are able to, to capture photos at a faster rate of speed, allowing you to fly faster. And then your photo clarity with a mechanical shutter as the drone's moving and mapping going to have a bit better detail there, uh, larger sensor sizes, ability to sync the RTK data to your imagery, and then higher camera resolution. Um, obviously, the One Pro, something like the M30T, is the IP55 rating. Um, so if there were operations at night, um, I'm sorry, not at night, but in adverse weather, um, you would be able to put the M30T up in that. So something to consider overall, but generally speaking here, our best solutions for survey and mapping for accident reconstruction are the Mavic 3E, the 300 plus the P1, while your general situational awareness still can be used, um, the sensors with the thermal there. And here's a quick sensor size comparison when you look at the P1, the Mavic 3E, and the Mavic 3T here on the bottom right um, so that just gives you an idea of the sensor size here. And, and Brandon, where does sensor size come into play um, for these operations? Do you see any difference when operating in day versus night? Yeah, so sensor size comes into play when it comes to ground sampling distance, right? The, it's all a mathematical formula on what your clarity or your final resolution for your final products is going to look like based off of your ground sampling distance and sensor size does go into that algorithm uh, for night operations it's also important to have a good sensor size that has a high dynamic range so that it can pull in a good amount of light and be able to uh, not have too much noise or not have too much lose that clarity based off of uh, the sensor that you're utilizing here um, so running something with a bigger sensor like that will give you better products, generally speaking. Yeah, and I think we can see that firsthand here with a quick comparison. This was out at the Law Enforcement Drone Association conference, kind of comparing the Mavic 3E and the Mavic 3T. So you can see at the higher level here, when we're talking about general situational awareness, they're going to be very similar. But as we begin to zoom in, and having the rolling shutter with the Mavic 3T, the Mavic 3E helps improve the clarity there. You can see part of that truck is almost missing there or that trailer comparing the two. And then when we get really close looking at ground sampling distance here, flight being at 125 feet, that's the Mavic 3T versus the Mavic 3E. So you can see you definitely have that better ground sampling distance that Brandon was referring to when you increase our sensor size and capabilities. So once again, just some data points there for you to see and consider. Next one we want to jump in here is we have our drone and getting out to the scene. What, what do we want to prepare? What do we want to consider? Um, and I'll pass this over to you, Brandon, to kind of talk us through a few items, including uh, accuracy and, and RTK. Um, what are you thinking about or what should agencies think about um, in this realm? Um, so whenever your agency is looking at accuracy, it's very important to talk to your district attorneys and find out what type of practices they want to align with. Um, if your agency is, is and your district attorneys, county attorneys are not uh, all too worried about absolute accuracy, then you can use things like your total station and, or known measurements in your scene and still maintain a high level of relative accuracy. Uh, if your district attorney, like uh, my district attorney, district attorneys uh, were wanting, they wanted to align with best practices for surveyors and, and other remote sensors. And so we needed absolute accuracy, meaning we had to keep an RTK system on hand. We had to do ground control points and checkpoints to maintain that best practice. Um, and so 
The big difference is relative accuracy is all the measurements that you will capture or all the measurements that you do in your project in Terra or whatever, pro uh, whatever processing system you'll use, the measurements are accurate relative uh, to your scene. Uh, so in this example, you can see we did measurements of the width of the roadway and the marked lane. And on the right hand side, you can see those measurements are accurate, relatively speaking. Um, on this scene, we also did RTK, um, an RTK rover, and we captured those points as well. So we had absolute accuracy associated with this scene as well. Um, absolute accuracy is the accuracy for uh, your scene based on off of real world measurements. So if you needed to be able to take your project and put it back on the physical earth, you can do that uh, based off of the latitude and longitude information with your project. You mentioned RTK there. Um, so I know you mentioned initially, maybe we'll jump into GCPs and, and checkpoints here first, um, but on your, your scene putting down uh, ground control points and, and checkpoints with uh, an RTK uh, station? Yeah, so we would put um, ground control points out across our scene uh, and you wanna try to evenly distribute those out. Easiest way that I explained it to my guys was imagine your project is a tabletop. Your ground control points are the legs that stand your table up. So you don't wanna have too many of them on one side. You don't wanna have them all condensed in one location. You wanna have them evenly distributed to help stand the table. Um, and so one of the things we do is we put those those targets out there and then we would take our RTK rover um, and then we would capture those known ground control points for each one of those targets. Uh, and the example we have here is we have that white on black ground control point target there. Um, and so what we would do is we go get the rover and we put it right on top of there and capture that known that known point. Definitely. Makes sense, makes sense. And just a quick clarification for those who may not be aware when we're talking about ground control points, that's something we're gonna use during the processing of the model. And then checkpoints, we'd collect them in the same manner, but we can use it afterwards, afterwards, I'm sorry, to verify our, our accuracy. Um, and outside of that RTK rover on the, the ground, Brandon, what do we want to consider when it comes to using an RTK module on the on the drone itself, and and what's the point? Uh, so one of the benefits of using the RTK uh, accessory on top of the Mavic Mavic 3 Enterprise is it allows you to connect to um, RTK corrections. So as the drone is flying, uh, it is able to get the corrected GPS data based off of your uh, in-trip connectivity and it will write that data to those images. And so whenever you pull those into uh, DJI Terra, whatever processing system you're utilizing, those images will have the corrected RTK information, which allows you to have more accurate image locations, which helps with the overall accuracy of your project. Um, generally speaking, only using the RTK accessory on top of the Mavic 3 Enterprise, I'm looking at around a three, three centimeter uh, RMSE or my uh, root mean square error uh, for my georeferencing of the drone images. Uh, if I incorporate in an RTK rover into that, I'm typically seeing around one centimeter accuracies. Um, some of the considerations that to take into that is if, it, if you don't have a clear line of sight to the sky, um, then you're, you're not gonna have good RTK correct connectivity. Um, if you're in a non-cellular environment, then you're not going to have good RTK connectivity. And so you will only have relative accuracy in there. Uh, as with all things, nothing is a silver bullet. So you have to take into your environment uh, into account whenever you're, you're looking at what type of accuracy you wanna have when starting to collect this data. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Thanks for a good, good summary there. In the, the meantime, I checked in with the audience. It looks like about half of folks are utilizing RTK, while almost three quarters looking at, at known measurements. So interesting to see there. With the Mavic 3E, we do offer two options for connecting to RTK within the Pilot 2 app. Like Brandon mentioned, you can use a local NTRIP network to connect to, or you could also connect to the DJI DRTK2 base station, but you will need to place that over a known point on your scene. We are looking for absolute accuracy there. Really, I'll say one other thing on the scene consideration side, um, perhaps you can talk to this, Aaron, 
would be regarding what do we need to think about outside of our, our drone? What comes into play when you're, you're setting up a scene with these years of experience on, on your end? Well, <clears throat> there are, there's a lot of stuff. It's uh, a lot of stuff that you got to take into consideration is what that drone is going to crash into when you hit the when you hit the start button. Uh, a lot of people don't take that into consideration, especially if you're flying a scene at night. Uh, you know, you get you get there, you get the 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 you know you're you're nervous you're you want to hurry up and get this thing going um you got people you know wanting to know how long that's going to take uh, because they want to get the roadways opened up um so you're not you're not checking everything so the first thing you got to definitely make sure is your minimal you know clearance altitude clearance uh tree lines electrical lines uh cell phone towers um you got to make sure that you're going to have clearance when you're when you hit that play button or or the start button when that thing takes off and during the day uh when we train this uh, you know uh, mapping with with students when we're teaching this um or pilots student pilots is during the day, it seems like they're they're okay to fly because they can obviously see. At night, when you have your VOs watching that thing, it's you're sending a drone up into the darkness, and and that tense level is definitely very high. So you uh, you definitely got to make sure what's going on. Um, the other thing to take into consideration is you know we had an accident yesterday that we have we have you know a life flight that's coming in and landing on a scene and they were roughly about a mile away from that scene uh, so when you want to start you know flying that accident but you still have a a life flight on scene you got to take that in consideration too you got to wait till all airspace is cleared um and then you know down where brandon is i don't have that problem up here in nebraska because we don't have you know news media uh helicopters flying around i'm not sure brandon does down there uh but out in california where you have a lot of news media uh helicopters flying around is you got to take that into consideration too when you're doing you know accent scenes and and scenes like that is is definitely got to make sure that you're you have the the clearance to fly to fly those accent scenes and get the proper authorization to fly those scenes. So, yeah, very important on the deconflicting air airspace side to have a, a safe light. Anything uh, to add on your side, Brandon, when kind of arriving on on scene and, and setting up? Uh, yeah. So one of the things that we take into consideration is what our scene looks like. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, crash scenes are nice and uh, complex, uh, which gives all the processing software things to look at and things to say, okay, that's the same object and then all these same images. But if you're doing say disaster response or a wildfire burn, things of that nature, flying low, having a low ground sampling distance um, is not what you're looking for. You wanna have your need to fly higher so that you can give uh, the processing software more things to look at and more things to identify. If you have a fairly homogenous scene, uh, the processing softwares have a difficult time discerning what what one thing is to the next uh and so that's one of the considerations like we don't have snow but snow is a prime example of that um snow is really hard to map because it doesn't know if that snowflake is the exact same snowflake in the next image with in the next image in the next image and so you may need to fly higher to give uh those images more objects in the, each image uh, another thing to take into account is uh, reflectivity of the surface. Uh, so if it is a wet surface uh, for whatever reason, um, that also can can uh, provide difficulties and challenges to the processing software. So again, you may have to fly a little bit higher there uh, to help with uh, help the processing softwares figure out what's what. Definitely, good consideration there as well. So. Moving into the data collection side here, and I will say in, in our handouts, we have a lot more detailed information on some of the scene preparation topics that we covered shortly. So certainly feel free to jump into those more as, as well if you're looking to learn more about accuracy and RTK and those type of topics. If those are new on your side. But getting into data collection, we have a few different options. Can utilize the Pilot 2 app which is built on your controller and offers a free option to fly our scene. And then we also have the mobile SDK, which offers the ability to customize missions and a little more interoperability across your command staff 
and team members. But covering the Pilot 2 side today, Aaron, what are we thinking about um, first daytime? We'll get into nighttime later during the webinar, but camera settings wise, what are we thinking about during the, the daytime? You know, when, when I'm flying a scene during the day, I usually will, being a camera guy, uh, you know, a long time camera guy, the very first thing I always tell people is when you put the SD card in, always format the SD card. Uh, always, always, always format that SD card. Uh, that's usually the first thing that I'll do is when you turn the drone on, when you're getting ready to to fly a scene, it doesn't matter if you're mapping or you're just using that drone to document that scene, always format that card. Um, it's just should be a rule uh, that you should always do is always format that card. Um, so when I'm getting ready to map, uh, I'll put it on a JPEG. If I had my way, I would shoot raw, and then I would convert that raw to a to a JPEG form uh, in post processing. Um, but but just just for now, uh, I would put it over to JPEG, um, put it on mechanical shutter, um, and then I would leave it as as an auto uh, setting, and let that camera uh, you know basically just put put you know, pick it, pick the auto setting during the daytime. Um, you know, Brandon mentioned uh, one time that, you know, d you know, if it's a cloudy day, um, you know, maybe adjust the settings a little bit. I agree with that. Um, if you have any doubt, um, if it's a cloudy day, or if you have a nasty shadow for some odd reason, you know, if you're next to a tree line, uh you know on a on a rural road and and you're next to a tree line or you're in between a couple tree you know a tree line on both sides of the road and and it's a little dark there if in doubt take that drone hover over the middle of your scene take a photo of it and look at your photo why why that drone's hovering over it and if something doesn't look right if it if it, if it looks dark or if it looks you know blown out uh, adjust your camera setting a little bit and put it in a manual, you know, in the manual setting, and and then and then you know, plan your mission setting and and put it on put it on a manual setting and 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 let your map go. So if if in doubt, if you think that there's shadows or or you know the, or your exposure is 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 blown out, just take a quick photo of the, of the middle of your scene and and just double check. But during the day. 90% of the time, 95% of the time, I always use auto setting, so. Yeah, no, fun fact about Aaron, he's actually quite the quite the photographer. If you're a fan of Nebraska, some of the photos you've probably seen there come from, from Aaron himself, so really a wealth of photography knowledge. Aaron, if we do go into those manual settings, is, is there anything we want to avoid or any setting we want to like leave as, as, as is? What are maybe some guidelines if we're going into to manual. So if you're ever going into manual setting, the only thing I could tell you, which is absolutely a rule of thumb, is your minimum shutter speed to eliminate motion blur is 1 60th of a second. 1 slash 60th of a second. You can never go below 1 60th of a second. Doesn't matter if it's nighttime or daytime. Now, during the daytime, if you go one sixtieth of a second and it's the middle of the afternoon, your ISO should be 100. And at one sixtieth of a second at ISO 100, it looks like you're shooting white paper because you're going to be, it's it's not going to happen. So um, most, most of the time, you're going to be like uh, one two hundredth of a second or a one, you know, two hundred fiftieth of a second at ISO 200 during the daytime. So, but rule of thumb, the most important setting that you always will have to remember, it doesn't matter if it's at night or at day, the minimum shutter speed that you'll always have to remember is 1 60th of a second is the slowest shutter speed that you could possibly go. So. Yeah, great tip. Appreciate that. Um, and just quick screenshots here from the Pilot 2 app. Um, we can take a look here, just making sure in the settings menu, your image ratio, your image format, click the three dots, make sure your mechanical shutter is on and de-warping is off. Format the SD card like Aaron talked about and then 
kind of on the Pilot2 homepage, making sure all modules are, are up to date. And de-warping might be a setting uh, some of you aren't familiar with, Brandon. Um, so could you tell us, looking at this photo, is de-warping um, enabled here, or, or what, do, what are we uh, looking at here? <laughs> Right. So just as you had just mentioned, you want to make sure that you have uh, dewarping turned off. You want to, essentially the way that it works in, in the, and uh, Grant, you may be able to clarify this because I probably am going to explain it badly, but it's essentially cropping it. And you want to make sure that you're not cropping that sensor out. Uh, so you want to make sure you have dewarping turned off and so that you're going to see those, what I call vignetting uh, in the top corners. However, it doesn't affect the processing at all. Uh, you will not see it in any of the uh, any of your final products uh, utilizing any of the softwares that I've tested with the Mavic 3 Enterprise Series. Yep, I think that's short and sweet, nailed it. So now getting into data capture, this is um, a scene we're out with uh, Brandon capturing an example, and you can see that we have our automated data capture up top. Um, here when we've pulled the photos into Terra, and then we have two what we call manual data capture circles. So getting into this process a bit, Brandon, for your daytime photo collection strategy, um, one of the best ways to collect overlapping photos is using some of the mission planning tools that are available in Pilot 2 or, or different SDK software. Um, so if you first open up the Pilot app, you go into Flight Route, Create Route, you have a variety of options here, including mapping, oblique, or linear. And just for the sake of time today, going to refer you to our DJI Enterprise YouTube page, which has training courses on all of these different modes, on how you'd set it up, and, and really how things work. Um, but I want to get in today with our panelists is some of the key settings in here when we're planning an automated mapping mission, that lawnmower pattern where we're capturing overlapping photos. So, uh, Brandon, from your side, you talked about what we're capturing affecting altitude, but generally speaking, what else comes into your decision when determining altitude, overlap, and some of the different options there, such as oblique or, or smart oblique? So, it what we end up doing is the first thing we're going to look at is what does our operational environment look like? If we're going to have high trees, power lines, and things of that nature, we want to fly at the lowest altitude. We can safely clear all obstacles. Um, and so that's going to be one. And so if I'm going to set up my autonomous mission, I want to make sure that I can clear all of that. In Houston, uh, in my area, generally speaking, uh, that's around 120 feet. Uh, so most of our autonomous mapping missions occur at around 120 feet. Um, so that's the first thing we'll do. The second thing that we pay attention to is what does our final product need to be? Is this a, a single vehicle accident um, where there's not gonna be any type of criminal uh, charges placed forward? Do I need a 3D model? If it's something that I don't need that, I just need a 2D diagram. I'm not going to spend the time to turn on Smart Oblique even though it's incredibly fast. Uh, I'm not going to spend the time to do the orbits and things of that nature. If this is something that I do need to have a good 3D model with, that's when I will start setting up smart obliques or I'll do a 3D grid pattern. Um, or I will do what we had in the previous uh, in the previous slide where we had the ladder with the orbits. Um, something to pay attention to is in this example, I had a nice clear area. This is our training field. Um, and so I can do that. But very, very often, I don't have the ability to set up an autonomous orbit or things of that nature, so I have to fly it manually. Uh, I may need to skirt in between power lines. I may need to do a half orbit around a wood line or things of that nature. So generally speaking, the ladder and the orbits, I typically am doing that manually, um, just because my operational environment doesn't allow for an autonomous mission. Um, so. One thing that I do want to stress is you can't make data from nothing. So whenever you are setting up your overlaps, you want to have a minimum of 80%, uh, 80, 70 on the front and side overlap. Um, I typically tell my guys to do 90, 90, uh, because again, I can't make data from nothing. I would rather have too many images than not enough images. And so we, we do 90, 90. It's a lot of images. It takes more battery life, um, but it's not that big of an issue. Um, but you want to have a minimum of 80-70 as far as the, the overlap goes. 
Um, Smart Oblique is also an outstanding option for the Mavic 3E and the, uh, the P1 system uh, because it allows you to do that 3D grid and it will automatically take the images for you so it doesn't take the time of a 3D uh, grid flight. Um, I love Smart Oblique with the P1. The first time I had it running, it kind of freaked me out because it looked like the camera was going nuts and I wasn't quite ready for that. <laughs> um, but it's, a, it's an outstanding feature uh, that saves a lot of time on the roadway. Very nice, very nice. And just a quick screenshot here. Um, go to photo timed and turn a, a timer on um, as a tool. If you're flying around the scene manually and you want to make sure you get overlapping photos, you can put that down to 0 0.7 seconds, I believe, on the Mavic 3E. Um, so that was what Brandon utilized here to manually fly these two circles. One good point of news as well is that we're planning to release the automated orbit feature for the Mavic 3 E, hopefully here in the next month or so. Um, so even if you're not as good as Brandon flying these nice, beautiful circles, uh, you'll be able to automate that too. But obviously just making sure to consider what's around your, your scene as well. So Brandon, just to confirm here, you did a 2D map over top, and then you did kind of a ladder here with a couple manually flown orbits and that you'd say, of the scene allows it, and you're trying to generate a 3D model, that'd be your typical data capture strategy? Correct, yeah. It's so what we'll do is we'll fly the 2D grid, as you see here. Um, the automatic setting for the enterprise, if you don't have uh, Smart Oblique turned on, is a, a 90 degree straight down or Nader uh, camera orientation. And then what I'll do is I will fly those two orbits. I don't descend on the first orbit anything less than 50% of my altitude for my grid. So, for example, for easy math sake, um, if I flew my grid at 100 feet, uh, then my lowest first, the lowest altitude I'll fly my first orbit is 50 feet. Typically, I'm around 60 for that. And then again, a half distance for the next orbit. Uh, so I wouldn't fly anything less than 25 feet for that. And then I do what I call the ladder, which I'll start at the altitude of my grid, and then I'll take photos roughly every five to 10 feet, um, all the way down to the uh, the lowest altitude I want to fly uh, over my focal point. And all that does, it's just a trick I've learned over the day, over the years of doing this, that um, it helps the processing system understand what's going on, where those images of the orbit need to be in, or, in relation to the 3D grid. Uh, so it just helps with the processing. Uh, it's not an exact science or anything like that. It's just lessons learned. Um, and so if I have multiple areas of the crash, like we had one uh, one fatal where we had our focal point here, and then there was a car who kind of ping-ponged through it all and landed over here. So I'd have two ladders and orbits uh, over those two focal points. So. Makes sense, makes sense. Yeah, I've seen some good success trying that out myself as well. So speaking of processing data, let's get into that next. And our DJI enterprise solution for that is called DJI Terra. And here's actually a 3D model from, from Brandon's side. And you can see some of the capabilities of Terra here in an area where it really shines in putting together these 3D models. Brandon, I don't know if you want to touch on anything about, about this scene or not. Uh, yeah, so this scene was obviously captured at night. Uh, we used Fox Fury Nomad 360s to illuminate the scene. Um, we also used our marked units to throw light with their high beams. Uh, we used their uh, the takedowns on the trucks. Um, and then we also used our firefighters to use their scene lightings because their uh, their fire trucks have outstanding um, outstanding lighting systems built into those as well. Um, and so the way that we did this scene, uh, this was actually shot with a Mavic 2 Pro. Um, I did this entire scene in video actually. Uh, and so the way that I set that up is I flew it the exact same way I would do a photogrammetry uh, scene. I turned video on, I flew my 3D grid, and then I flew my ladder and my orbits. Um, and then I went in and we pulled X amount of frames out. Uh, and I pulled the most amount of frames out that my computer could handle just to make sure that I had the proper amount of overlap. And then uh, I dumped these images into my processing system. I geo-referenced them again, utilizing our RTK rover. Um, and that's how I brought this, uh, that's how I created this scene. Uh, this scene was done at Terra, did an outstanding job. Uh, memory serves everything, and this scene was accurate to 1.2 centimeters. 
uh, total time on scene for me was 20 minutes, and that includes the flight and capturing the RTK ground control points. Um, granted, they were on scene for a little bit longer because they had to get the tow trucks out there. They had to do the rest of their investigation. But as far as a data collection standpoint, what used to take hours on hours on hours on hours, it, that was done in 20 minutes, uh, which is great. Yeah, That's awesome. And we'll jump into the nighttime a bit more with Aaron here shortly. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Terra, just some quick highlights for you. As you can see, the, the Terra engine, it's running its own engine that's been built over the years, which helps with creating some of these very robust 3D models. On the processing speed side, Terra is also built to process imagery quickly. So about in a minute, you could process 12 Mavic 3 Enterprise images for a 3D reconstruction and 36 images for a 2D reconstruction. So you'll notice the speed of Terra is a plus. Also, the data is stored and processed on your local computer. So there's no cloud processing or uploading on the Terra side. The interface is very simple for use when running a model through. And then there's also powerful tools that are built in on the Terra side alongside that simple interface. So something to consider with any photogrammetry software that you're running is you do need a high powered, uh, and from what I've seen, it's always Windows. I don't know of any that run on, on the Mac side and feel free to chip in in the comments if you have any, any uh, comments there. But generally speaking, for any type of offline photogrammetry software, you're gonna need a high powered Windows computer. So you can kind of see the minimum specifications for a computer here that we recommend for Terra, including the RAM, graphics card, and CPU. But just quickly showing some of the tools here in Terra. When you import photos, you can quickly select an area of interest or photos that you want to process. So that comes into play if you, once Brandon said, oftentimes you collect more data than you need on scene. If that's outside of the area and not relevant, you can easily delete that data. You can also edit your image metadata. So Brandon, I think this came up uh, with you when utilizing the RTK service because your NTRIP service was a different coordinate system um, than the drone. So we're able to edit the image metadata when importing. After you've completed the aero triangulation step in Terra, you can select a region of interest. So if there's point cloud data that's not relevant for your 2D map or 3D model, you can go ahead and select an area that you do care about or import that area. Brandon mentioned ground control points and checkpoints. So you can add those both in Terra for helping with the processing of your model and checking the accuracy after the fact. And then with the point tool, you can select any point within Terra, and then you're able to pull up individual images um, to zoom in if you'd like to look at an image that contains that point that you selected. After processing on the Terra side, you also get what we call a processing report. It gives you information about the camera, information about your ground control points, checkpoints, images, and all that good information as well. You've seen it in use a few times, but on the Terra side, you can also measure distance, area, volume, and specific coordinates as well. So hopefully that gives you an idea of Terra and some of the tools that are in it. Within our handout section, we have a link to a video and a PDF that goes over the process for creating a 2D map or 3D model and then some of the additional tools and how to use those. But after we've run our model through Terra and you have a 3D model um, output, you do also have the option to export that model into a variety of formats. If you'd like to do a point cloud, a 3D model, a TIFF, 2D map, those are all options and you can also select a coordinate system there for your output. 
But I think a question a lot of people uh, do have for Brandon and Aaron here is, what happens after Terra? What happens after we run our model through? So be curious to hear from you. You both here um, can start with uh, Brandon. But what does that process look like on your side after the processing is complete? So after the processing is complete, uh, one of the first things that we're going to do is create our 2D diagrams. Um, this is an example of one. So the diagram here is built in Esri, but you can build out any type of 3D uh, diagram based off of any kind of solutions that y'all may be using. I know a lot of agencies use uh, Leica's Map 360. A lot of agencies use Pharaoh Zone 3D. Um, whatever diagramming software you use uh, for what for us Paraland likes to use Esri because they make really nice diagrams here. Um, and so what we'll do here is we'll take our 2D ortho mosaic or 2D stitched image that's geo referenced and we will place this into uh, this what we call layout. Uh, from here I will put important markers in here, important measurements that we may have used for each one of these. Uh, so the red dots here are what we use for our ground control points. So those were known RTK rover data collection points that I did. Um, I captured more than I typically need. This was the very first scene uh, that we tried to use an RTK rover on. And so I captured a ton of them just to see what it would do. Um, so we captured a bunch of those. And then we also would uh, go through and Make sure that we have our or its scale orientation or our project orientation and our scale uh, scaled measurement at the very bottom there for diagramming purposes. And again, this is just for a 2D map. Um, I typically will do a scene overview diagram. I'll do a focal point diagram. I'll do a measurements diagram and anything else that the Crash Reconstructions thinks is pertinent. Uh, so one is one important part about the way that Pearland organized our team was our drone team supported crash reconstruction. So if they needed anything, we would provide it for them. So from a from a 2D diagram perspective, this is what a final product would look like. Uh, we also do uh, 3D animations. Uh, so what we would then do is we would take the point cloud that is generated either from uh, from DJI Terra, and we could put that into a program like Virtual Crash, or we can integrate that into Map360 or Pharaoh Zone, what have you, and do our physics engines uh, to test the map and to see what actually would happen with those uh, those systems. And then we also can host uh, the 3D models uh, in Esri as well, so that anybody can capture whatever measurements they want with the same model. It won't matter what measurement anybody takes, uh, so everybody is working with the same equipment. Uh, and then we take all of that data and we put it into evidence for chain of custody. Yeah, makes makes sense there. And Aaron, on your side, I know you touched on it a bit earlier, um, but you talked about um, on the fire side, um, to kind of add to, to Brandon's front, that you're able to review data after after an incident uh, with the team as a bit of a, a bit of a debrief. Yeah, so uh, with the help of Brandon, uh, he he uh, shared his uh, uh, knowledge about Esri, so we started using Esri so we can upload these maps to Esri where we could share uh, the links to uh, the you know the the uh, shift captains they can uh, do uh, their their debriefing on that and then when I get called out to assist with uh, accident reconstruction in different counties uh, I usually just go there to assist you know find the maps uh, I usually ask them you know what they need if they're going to put it in Faro uh, zone and if they do I know that I have to export that stuff into you know into an LAZ file and uh, and then I usually when I get done with that just give them all the documentation that I do and uh, chain of custody goes over to them and then I'm I'm sort of out of it then so all I am is just a just a, uh, a a guy that comes in and, and maps that and, and gives them the the information and and uh, I'm done. So uh, drones are starting to become a big thing now in in Nebraska because of Chief Wayne Baker's uh, presence up here in Nebraska. And uh, so it's starting to become a uh, more people are starting to get drones here in Nebraska and and uh, uh, in accident reconstruction is starting to become a big thing now in Nebraska. So. Um, I'm not ha I'm not having to fly as much as what I used to, so it's a good deal. Very nice, very nice. And here's an example here too of just merging a couple of point clouds 
And this is in cloud compare free software. So this is actually laser scanner data inside and drone data on top. So it's kind of split here, but you can see adding the drone data. And also, you know, Eric, we mentioned at the beginning, one of the big incidents he worked on was a train derailment and was able to merge laser scanners on the ground with the drone as well. So good opportunity to kind of work together on the on the two here. And um, before we jump into Aaron showing some examples from his end, and while we get that set up, Brandon, a key question from folks has been about data and at bringing that data into the trial or into the legal system. So I'd be curious to hear your experience there um, from your your work and how that went. Yeah, so in my area, uh, we went from a district attorney who was very adverse to technology to a new district attorney who was very pro-technology. And so one of the biggest things that we uh, had to navigate was how to show that the traditional methods that we had been use, using aligned with the way that we're doing it now, utilizing photogrammetry. And so we had to show, uh, we had to go in and do the same types of operations using traditional methods and do photogrammetry at the same time and then compare apples to apples and present that to our district attorney so that he could ask questions and he could try to poke holes in it so that we can build up his confidence and that we knew what we were talking about and the, the processes that we were utilizing are accurate. Uh, not only are they accurate, but they also align with traditional uh, surveying practices that have been tried in court over many, many, many years. Uh, that was a big, a big key point in that. Uh, there has been a few cases that I've had in pretrial where we have discussed the accuracies of uh, from a, both a defense attorney perspective, which is always entertaining, um, and a prosecution uh, attorney standpoint. And we would have those discussions and, and talk about how I know those measurements are accurate and how I know that uh, it's accurate across the entire footprint. And that's where it's highly important to utilize absolute accuracy because it allows you to ensure that you have an accurate project or some type of scale constraints so that you know that you have an accurate project across the entire um, project that you're, you're capturing those in, those measurements on. Um, so being able to prove that in court goes a really, really long way, not only in the confidence of your work, but also with the confidence of your uh, prosecutor. So if you're ending up having to uh, defend this in, in court, they understand that you do know what you're talking about and that you do know that your your information is accurate. Absolutely. Well, thanks for sharing that information. I know we had a lot of people curious about about that. Um, looks like we got Aaron all set up now to kind of run through some examples in Terra and specifically talk about data collection at night. So lighting, camera settings, Terra, take it away, Aaron. <laughs> So uh, the key question is, how many lights do we need to map at night? And uh, my uh, my answer to that is as much light as you could possibly get. Um, you know, I remember I was just talking to uh, Barry Moore this morning, and we were talking about the very first map that I ever flew at night, and uh, it was it was it was horrible. It was the worst thing that I that I ever could see, and uh, so. Um, I'm going to say probably minimum of three Fox Fury Nomad 360 lights. And there's a couple things that I wanted to show here uh, is obviously, um, like I was saying before, um, when you're flying at night, you obviously want to hover over that scene and you definitely want to set your camera uh, manually. Uh, first thing you want to do is the rule of thumb is never shoot below 1 60th of a second. If you shoot below 1 60th of a second, your camera, your images are going to be blurry. Uh, believe it or not, with this, uh, with this, uh, with this lighting setup, I was shooting at uh, 1 100th of a second and my ISO was 800, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, 800, ISO 800. Now, what's cool about the the M3E is when you zoom in here, there's hardly no uh, grain at all. Now, would it be better with the P1? Yeah, it would definitely be better with the P1, but it's still good. Um, now, when you go to the 3D, it's quite it's quite amazing, actually.
So I always say you always want to shoot with a halo of light and three is minimum. Cause if you would do two, you would have some horrible shadows and there's awful, obviously some different uh, lighting techniques that we can sh do too, uh, to get rid of some shadows underneath the truck and stuff like that. Um, you know, Brandon was talking about shooting in snow. Um, actually I love shooting in snow because it gives you a more light to play around with. Think about it as a big reflector. Everyone goes and gets their photos taken. The photo, you know, photographer walks out, you got these big reflectors, you know, that they're pointing at you. It's giving you actually more light to play around with when you're shooting in snow. Uh, so, um, three lights is minimum, um, two in the front or, or the impact zone one on the back side of it uh one thing i want to show you is what does it look with four lights then on that particular scene uh four lights is obviously a little bit better <clears throat> definitely really gets rid of those shadows then with four lights and the other thing about the fox fairy lighting is these are high CRI lights. So uh, it's definitely with the high CRI lighting with the Fox Fury, and I don't want to sit here and become a, a commercial for Fox Fury, but it, sh it shows true color with Fox Fury. Um, it's one of the only lights on the market. I'm not going to say it's the only light on the market, but it's the, the most important part about lighting up a scene at night is to make sure that those lighting goes up eight foot or higher. You want that lighting to shoot down on your subject or on your scene and not straight at. Uh, a lot of the lighting that you'll get at your hardware stores uh, will only go six foot and it's shooting at. And the only way I could describe that to you is we've all gone in and made our wives or our significant others happy to get our picture taken you know, in, you know, in a photography studio. And when you go to a photography studio and that photographer sets up those studio lights to take your picture, those lights aren't directly shooting at you. It's shooting down on you because if it shoots at you, you can tell just by my, my glasses when you're looking at me that you're gonna get a reflective uh, light you know, back at you. And you don't want that. If you, that light is shooting directly at your your scene, uh, you're going to get a lot of uh, reflective. You're going to get a lot of nasty shadows in there. So if you're going to go out and get lighting, uh, you know, to shoot uh, uh, scenes at night, you obviously want those lighting, you know, any kind of lighting that you're looking at getting to be at least eight foot or taller uh, to so you can shoot that down. <clears throat> now, one of the cool things about Terra, and we got to playing around with this here, uh, a couple weeks ago is this particular map. Now, Brandon, I'm gonna put you on the spot. I'm gonna have you guess how many lights I used to do this model. At one Thanks. time, or did you shift it like I do? <laughs> Three, I shifted. Four, five, six lights total? I only used four. So really nice, nice. That's that's the cool thing about Terra is, is you know, obviously we've got the ground control points exactly like you said, set the ground control points up like you're, you're, you're setting it up on a table. I didn't move the ground control points, uh, but it stitched those, you know, stitched those three maps uh, really, really good. Um, now, uh, what Brandon was saying, uh, can we get better, um, can we get better, uh, detail in the van. Uh, you've got to remember that up here in Nebraska, when we were flying this, it was minus 10 out that night that we were flying this. So we were hustling just a little bit. Uh, Brandon's uh, uh, a way of flying this is doing the orbits around this. Um, we did this uh, oblique flying, um, where if we would have dropped down a little bit and did the individual orbits around the vehicles, we would have probably got better detail on those vans. But like I said, we were hustling to try to get out of there. By the time that we were out of there, uh, we were pretty frozen. Uh, we did uh, three maps of this, and I'll show, I'll show you guys what the three maps look like. Um, so there's the one map on the excursion.
Oh, sorry about that. I hit the wrong one. Map in the middle. So all we did was we just shifted those lights back and forth to always have those ground control points in. And then uh, we just combined those three maps together and it was really simple to to get that to get that last map. So the accuracy was pretty pretty uh, spot on too. Um, and it was it was and there's the first one with the van. So yep. So a lot of people want to know how many lights do I need to do a big scene? It depends, you know, budget wise. Um, depends on time. You know, if you got the time to move your lights around, uh, you can easily stitch your map together like what I just showed you in Terra. Uh, it's really, really simple. As long as you don't mess your ground control points up. Those ground control points help stitch those maps together, especially if you're using RTK to, to hit those ground control points uh, with an RTK rover system. It just brings that map all together more accurate too between all those maps. One last map that I wanted to show off um, is a map that we had. And this is one that uh, is one that we like to show off. And this is one that for the fire department, it just gives us an example of, of how we can sit in here and debrief an accident. You know, it's a foggy morning. Uh, you know, obviously a truck pulled out in front of another truck. This is just something that, you know, departments, we had several departments on this as a, as a mutual aid department, um, you know, mutual aid call. It just gives fire departments a way to sit here and debrief this on how apparatuses came in, uh, where they were stationed. Um, you know, if this call comes in again on this particular highway, uh, you know, this main highway that feeds our community, you know, if, if another, you know, if an accident like this ever happens like this again, how do we, you know, how do we, you know, pull into an accident like this? I mean, there's, there's a lot of discussion with fire departments on, on this particular scene. You know, if you look, we have, you know, we have vehicles here, you know, on a, you know, on a, head facing a different direction on 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 that highway that's supposed to go the other direction uh you know so we we do mapping like that on on fire calls too and there's one particular fire call that we had um this uh this past fall that we had a fire i mapped it because the guys wanted to know is basically in the middle of the block on uh, what hydrant was closer you know, was it the south hydrant or was it the north hydrant? And it was almost 150 foot difference. They hit the longest hydrant. And I kid you not, uh, about, I want to say about a month later, we had a fire at that particular house again. And because of, because of the, you know, the debriefing of the maps and stuff, they hit the closer hydrant this time. So it was this you know, situational awareness, looking at those maps, debriefing, and and just you know going over that kind of stuff just helps, uh, I guess, preparation of of the next call when it comes to comes on the fire side of it. So, phenomenal. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Aaron. That's cool to see those scenes and lighting tips as well. Um, so mentioned it earlier if you are interested in a three-month trial license for dji terra you can scan the qr code here um, with, with the phone to go ahead and do this three-month trial survey you'll be sent a three-month trial code uh, this does if you're watching this as a replay will need to be done before february 3rd um, if you'd like to do this. Um, while we leave this up for a second, wanted to jump into some of the questions that people submitted when registering for the webinar. And the first one, I know we've talked a lot about of topics here, but for a department that's just getting started using drones for vehicle crash reconstruction, what considerations or, or thoughts might you might you add for them? And Brandon, we'll start with you and then hear from Aaron as well on this one, because I think it's an important question. So for uh, starting out, 
equipment, you need a, a minimum of a, a drone that has a decent uh, decent camera. So again, it's going to be very variable on what uh, what your budget looks like. The Mavic 3E is a great option. Uh, it's a low price point, uh, but you can do you can do photogrammetry with anything. You can do it with your cell phone if you needed to. Um, so whatever drone that you can use to allow you to get an aerial perspective and take photos um, is a great entry point. Um, going back to talking with your district attorneys, uh, you need to find out if they want you to align with best practices for surveyors. Uh, and if that's the case, then you're going to need some type of RTK system. Um, we went through forensic mapping solutions to discuss that. They have a bunch of really great alternatives. Uh, you may want to reach out to your GIS divisions with your cities or counties. Uh, they may already have RTK units and pay for this, the services. Uh, so you may not have to spend any money like we did, uh, where our GIS division had had a, a Trimble unit and we were able to start leveraging that. Um, and then of course your, your processing software. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you have something that is going to be able to take the data and be able to georectify and, and correctly create those models and processes like DJI Terra, which is just outstanding. Um, and then you want to have a computer that can handle the the, uh, the workload, just like Grant was talking about earlier. Um, there are a lot of uh, computers out there. You want to make sure that you have a lot of RAM. Uh, so that it can handle a lot of images. G generally speaking, I'm looking at somewhere between 300 to 1,000 images per uh, for every scene, and every scene is a little bit different, which is why the variation is so big. Um, but generally speaking, we're seeing around that. Uh, we use a uh, company called Puget Systems that builds compu computers specifically for photogrammetry. Uh, doesn't matter what the processing software is, which is really nice, and they have they have some pretty good deals. Um, so you want to have a minimum of a computer that can do the processing, the data, the software to process that data, uh, and a drone that has a good camera on it. Um, that's what's going to be the uh, the minimum entry that you need. Uh, if you have to have an RTK, then you have to add that in. But uh, make sure that you talk to your district attorneys and see what exactly what they're looking for uh, so that you can make those assessments. Um, anything to add on this one, Aaron? Uh, I would say that, you know, the M3E is probably, uh, you know, with all the drones out there, the M3E is probably the best, you know, not the best drone, but probably one of the better choices to get out there. It's, it's, uh, it's very, uh, uh, budget friendly, uh, right now to get into. Um, uh, I agree with everything that Brandon Carr is saying, uh, the computer, I think, uh, issue or the computer, uh, side of it is, is, is the shocking uh is the shocking uh point uh that a lot of a lot of uh uh you know law enforcement and, and fire departments agencies uh don't really understand is is you got to have that computer to process that uh the only thing that i'm going to say is is go out and train with it uh you got to go out and you got to go out and, and fly missions and and understand what that drone is going to do when you do a smart oblique mission or when you do distant oblique mission or just a regular mapping mission you got to understand what that drone is going to do um because the first time i did an oblique mission with the m3e the thing started flying backwards and i'm like okay well that's interesting i wasn't quite prepared for that yet um but you know when you start to understand what that thing is going to do it doesn't really freak you out and you want to do that during the day so if you get called out at night you fully understand what that thing's going to do when you hit the start button no great point great points um continuing on with some questions here um, cost obviously a question from folks for TerraSide. You're looking at in US dollars, 1,540 per year, or you can buy a permanent license for 4,400, and that's 440 a year after the first year for additional updates. And then for the drone side, the Mavic 3 Enterprise, your base package is around 3,800 US dollars, but can be in the 4,000 to $5,000 range if you're adding additional batteries chargers etc so let's say maybe around five thousand dollars and a fully kitted out mavic 3e there um, and i think we talked about some of the other costs of getting a program started as as well uh, computer or the processing side is definitely 
a must if you want to do your processing locally there. Um, here's an interesting one that we've gotten from some folks. Can the Mavic Mini be used for crash reconstruction? Uh, Brandon, what are, you, what are your thoughts here? Brandon. There it is. There um, it is. <laughs> so the when the Mavic Mini One first came out, I was teaching uh, a class in Georgia for Georgia State Police, um, and we ran over to Gresco and grabbed one. <laughs> and I actually did a Mavic uh, mapping mission. So again, uh, any camera can be used. However, you have to take into the uh, all the camera spec, uh, all the camera specifications into account. Uh, if you're going to be using a system like this. Uh, so that is a low megapixel camera, it is a low sensor size. Um, it does not have a high dynamic range. Um, and so you have to take that into account. All that means is you're going to have to fly lower uh, and you're going to have to take more photos. Um, so to answer the question directly, can it be used? Yes, is it recommended? No, um, that's just something you have to, you have to to work with now if that's the only thing that your agency has by all means uh you know and, and use that platform build out uh some some successful projects to get a better platform the next year on the next budget year all right i think that's good there uh aaron one for you here you talked about some of the camera settings um, but some specific concerns here about white cars creating what is labeled as a burnt hole in the 3D model. Is that something you've encountered or any tips here that you might share? Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, white cars during a day uh, when you have that high sun, uh, that is definitely, definitely a, uh, uh, a, a tough situation. Even a white car, you know, when you have the lights at night. So what I recommend is there again, uh, you know, hovering that drone, taking a couple photos and trying to pick that middle. So if you think about it, uh, us camera guys will do a bracket uh, photo uh, where you take three photos. You take a high exposed photo, a dark photo, and then a medium photo, and you combine the three. Now, obviously you can't do that with a drone. Uh, so what I'm saying is take a high exposed photo, take a low exposed photo, and take a normal photo and look at all three of them and try to figure out what photo at what exposure is going to give you the most detail of that white car. And, but then you got to look at your other detail that you're also going to need <clears throat> in that particular scene. So you're going to want to take a couple photos at different exposures and see what's the happy medium and, uh, and then go from there. But you're bringing up an excellent point of, of, of some of the situations that you're gonna run into. Uh, some of the situations we're gonna run into, white car in snow, uh, or the other one that we'll run into, <clears throat> or some people will run into, black on black at night, and or uh, skid marks at night on an asphalt. Uh, those are always tough situations that you gotta to try to photograph, so. Thank you, sir. And question, I guess, comes from my side here. Any plans to make a Mavic with an IP rating? Unfortunately, you can't talk about anything on the future side, but obviously we have released the new Mavic series recently. Unfortunately, it does not have an IP rating. When we do get into IP rating and something like the M30, those type of materials are a bit heavier. So it's definitely an engineering challenge there, but certainly something to consider in the future. Um, in regards to weather conditions exceeding the aircraft profile, I wouldn't recommend flying from the manufacturer side there, um, but I guess that is something to ask too, Brandon. If you are having some rain in the in the forecast, is there a situation or it is raining where you'd still put up something like the M30T and try to capture some data, or are you finding that you're getting you know some water on the lens and it's not uh, worth it at that point? What's what's your right. I guess uh, reaction there. So, um, just what you said, the, getting any type of moisture or water on the lens, it ruins your entire data set. Uh, 
prior to using photogrammetry for crash reconstruction, we have been doing it without having the actual vehicles in the in the uh, models for years and years and years. Um, so it's it's a non-issue for for us uh, to just handle it the old way, tow those vehicles out, I let that weather pass through. I can come back in and map the roadway with all the paint markers on the ground, and I then I can artificially add those vehicles back into my diagram. Uh, and still be able to maintain a high level of accuracy. Makes sense. Uh, go back to, to Aaron here. When you're arriving at the accident, what total area would you consider covering or, or mapping? Say you're drawing out your automated mission. Uh, what what area are you going to be considering there? Um, well, that's a loaded question. Uh, if if I'm if I'm just going to cover for the fire department, what I'll do is I'll ask uh, the IC, or you know, uh, I'll ask our IC that's in control of that uh, in control of that scene, and I'll be like, hey, do you want me to map this accident for our debriefing? And if they say yes, I'll ask them, you know, roughly how how much do you want this this covered and they'll tell me or i'll use best judgment now if i get called out to assist with with accident reconstruction uh, of that scene um i'm not in charge of that i'm just there to assist so i will ask them you know hey how much do you want this covered and they will give me those those uh those uh, uh details um but rule of thumb is is obviously you want um probably a, uh you know, at least 100 foot on both directions of that debris field, um, or where, you know, where, uh, you know, where they're entering the ditch or whatever. They, you know, the the investigating officers will usually have an area where they want that accident scene marked, where they want that, where they want that covered. So, Brandon, you might want to step in and and maybe answer that too a little bit. Exactly right, Aaron. Uh, the first thing that I do is I find out how big my scene is, uh, and then I will capture, make sure that I do a good amount of overlap outside of my scene parameters to make sure that my entire scene has good image overlaps. Um, so that's the biggest things that I take into consideration. Um, again, going into uh, safety, I make sure that first on scene, uh, handle the scene, make sure everybody is safe. Uh, and then once it moves from a reactionary perspective into a um, response perspective, then I'll start worrying about building out a, a mapping scene and things of that nature. Um, making sure I'm not underneath any power lines whenever I launch the drone, uh, that's highly important, overhanging trees, things of that nature. Uh, make sure that I have all the airspace authorizations that I need. Um, the other thing to take into consideration is di the dynamicness of the scene. Um, so if you are going to be capturing your your scene whenever you start flying the drone, the first thing that I'll yell out is, hey, I'm about to take a whole lot of photos. Uh, so if you want to be in the evidence, make sure that you don't move. If you want to be out of it, make sure that you get out of my scene. Uh, and typically you'll see people scurry off uh, fairly quickly for, after that, uh, which makes a nice static scene. You don't want to have a lot of movement going on whenever you're capturing all of those images. Otherwise, it can mess up the processing soft side of the house. Uh, so I'm trying to make sure you can have as as static as a scene as possible. Yep. Makes sense. One more question here from the pre-submitted ones is, uh, what aircraft is DJI compatible with? Does that include Mavic 2 Enterprise Advanced? And you can process the 2D maps and 3D models in Terra with images from any DJI aircraft and a variety of other cameras as, as well. You just really need the metadata within the photo for that reconstruction process to happen. And we are running a bit short on time here with about five minutes left. I wish we had some time, maybe we'll go a, a few minutes over. Uh, but Chief Baker, I know you've been in the background here and overwhelmed a bit with the, the question side, but um, is there a couple of questions you've gotten or maybe you've gotten a few people asking um, for the panelists that you'd want to uh, share here? Yes, first, let me apologize for uh, misreading and misspeaking on the uh, Brandon Carr question about the orbit. Um, I still don't believe that he has that good of skills, but um, the orbit is not a feature um, right now, although we, uh, I know Grant has been discussing that internally. Um, 
Some of the uh, good questions we've had, I know there have been several on thermal mapping, which um, I know is not something a lot of people uh, have necessarily looked into, uh, if uh, anyone can address that one. So I've done some thermal mapping, uh, Chief. Um, I can only think of two scenes that we've done some thermal mapping with with our uh, fire investigator, our fire marshal. Uh, one was a particular uh, uh, salvage uh, uh, salvage scene, um, and what we were trying to pinpoint was pretty much the hottest zone of that particular fire. It showed us that, um, but it really didn't give us a whole lot of data. Um, and then the other one was sort of uh, a house burn that we were doing, trying to uh, practice or trying to use uh, that 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 thermal mapping to see if if I got on scene fast enough. Why like while, while locating the fire, can I hurry up and do a thermal mapping of a particular house fire while they're fighting it? And uh, the answer is, is I just don't have enough time to do that. So I've, I've only done it twice. And uh, one time was during a fire and one time was after or after a fire to see if we can find the hottest, hottest area of a fire. And both are for good maps, but you have to be able to fly in a fire in a, on a fire scene very, very quick to to really make it work, I guess is my own honest opinion on it. So um, I haven't had the opportunity to test this yet, uh, but while I was at the last uh, law enforcement drone association conference, there was a crash investigator that was talking about how he also shoots his crash investigations in thermal. Uh, and the reason is he's able to see uh, yaw marks or skid marks um, easier on thermal than he is on RGB, especially for light skids uh, or light yaw marks, because as they put that rubber down on the road, it has a different emissivity as the asphalt or the concrete. And so they actually pop a little bit better. And I thought that was super interesting because I never thought about doing that. Um, and so that's that's certainly something that I'm very interested in trying. I just haven't had the opportunity to do so, but uh, something that, y'all may be able to give a shot and then let us know. It would be interesting. I think you'd have to fly it really low, Brandon, honestly, to get yeah. that. I mean, you'd have to fly that thing really, really low and you'd have to fine tune that quite a bit, I would think. So Right, well, going back into sensor size, right? Sensor 640 yeah. by 512. Uh, so you will have to fly that lower, uh, but he, he said that he had great results from it. Um, and so I thought that was super interesting. Like I said, I haven't had the opportunity to test that, so I don't know if, how well that actually works or what the workflow is for that, but uh, he spoke highly of it. I'm thinking I'm going to have to come down to Texas and we're going to have to, you know, maybe uh, crash some cars. <clears throat> come on. You also love it. To take, into, take into account the atmospheric conditions, especially in South Texas on a hot day. But I know we do have other verticals, um, Grant, that, utilize uh, in the energy sector uh, thermal mapping such as solar uh, inspection um, and then two follow-up questions grant uh, on Terra one was in regards to will it work on Mac um, and another was can you utilize non-enterprise imagery uh, and I believe also not just non-enterprise but the other imagery in terra yes so you cannot utilize you cannot run it on a mac it only runs on windows and then you can utilize photos from other drones as well not just the mavic 3 enterprise or the or the m300 uh, to do your 2d maps or 3d models um, just would want to consider uh, maybe if you had like a mavic mini you won't be able to like automate the flight and then the, obviously the camera of differences among among others so yep and then sorry just quick note it seems the survey <laughs> is down maybe too many people taking it right now so we'll make sure to send up a follow-up email if you'd like to take that and get a three-month trial to the Terra side so yes yes um, but I think we are running up on time here. Chief, any final questions before we wrap things up here?
there are so many. Um, <laughs> I think one of the other other last uh, questions that might be beneficial for all is, uh, what are you guys using for GCPs? I'm not sure that was covered already. Uh, as far as what we're using for what we're laying down for GCPs, their chief, or I believe that how, was the question, or how are we marking them with a rover based system? I, th I think the question was using for uh, laying down, but also I did see another one that also uh, questioned are you using known points or RTK? So just kind of real quick how you're getting your measurements, I think. So, uh, so what I do um, is uh, I, so to get the GCP points, uh, what I do is I'll set up a base station, um, a, a uh, third party base station, and uh, that will hook into an intrep, intrep, uh, that uh, and then I'll use a PIX4D Vidox system to get the to get the uh, G, GPS uh, coordinate systems off of the GP or off the ground control uh, points. The ground control points uh, I just buy off of Amazon. Um, they're the white and black two foot by two foot checkers with uh, zero to ten. Um, I got some orange and black ones. I got some some uh, uh, white and black ones. Uh, but that's how that's that's what I do. So uh, now what I'm going to say is if you're going to do that, make sure to study up on how to set your uh, coordinate systems, uh, because that's the biggest uh, that's the biggest thing that you're going to have to really study is how to set up your coordinate systems to to get those GPS coordinate systems to talk with Terra or if you're using PIX4D or drone deploy or whatever, you got to make sure to set up your coordinate systems right. So, Brandon? Uh, so, it depends on the scene on which targets I put out, uh, but we have the forensic mapping solutions. Um, we have the forensic mapping solutions targets that they sell. It comes with 10, pro, uh, 10 hard non-reflective uh, metal targets, which is great because wind won't blow them over, or if somebody runs over the ground control point, it's not gonna damage it. Uh, but those are high contrast as well. Uh, in the event that we cannot put ground control points at targets out there uh, for whatever reason, um, we'll paint targets on the ground. Uh, just whenever you're doing that, make sure that you uh, itemize out your numbers properly uh, so that you know which targets are which ones so that you don't shoot a ground control point four on ground control point one. Um, and then the other thing that you want to make sure that you take into account is how big of an area that you're using the stake in the, your RTK system, how big that error is. So we'll typically paint a dot, draw a circle, and then run the number next to it. We want to make sure that that dot isn't any bigger than, say, a half dollar, uh, because that is going to be your margin of error no matter what you do, because you don't have a finite point like you do in the targets. Um, so that's a that's a margin of error that we're willing to accept uh, on a scene um, in those instances. Awesome. And what is the specific base station you use on your end, Brandon? There's just a question on that. Uh, so we have uh, we had the forensic uh, the forensic mapping solutions RTK bundle. It was a bundle that they put together. Uh, and lately, we have been transitioning to a Trimble R2 unit. Got it. Alrighty. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much to both Brandon and Aaron for sharing some of their valuable time to prepare for this webinar and to join us uh, today. Really a wealth of, of information um, that they teach across the nation and really honored to have them on the, the webinar today. So thank you both and thank you for Chief Baker in the background as well. Um, sorry we weren't able to get to all of the questions today, but you're welcome to follow up with me via email and you'll also be getting a recording of the webinar here today as well and we'll plan to post that up on youtube as well so thank you very much and hope you all have a great day thanks guys thank you all